Hi, this is Dr. Steven, and today we are excited to bring to you some of the cast and leadership of fellow travelers being brought to you by Florida Grand Opera coming April 23rd through April 28th, 2022 to the Lauder Hill Performing Arts Center. I want to mention first that tickets can be got can be bought at fgo.org. And again, that's April 23rd through the 28th at 2022 at the Lauder Hill Performing Arts. Uh, we want to bring everybody into the screen and uh, welcome them in today. Welcome to uh, OutClick Magazine, The Dr. Steven Show. We're anxious to talk about uh, your upcoming show. Hey, thanks for having us. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, as he's bringing them in, Andy, tell us about yourself. Yeah, uh, my name is Andy Acosta. Um, I'm actually from Miami originally, from Hialeah. <laughs> um, I'm okay. Cuban. Uh, I grew up in this area, uh, and I went to a performing arts high school uh, just in Coconut Grove. Um, and this is my first time back to Miami to perform since I left for school. Um, I'm really excited to be here, uh, to have a bunch of friends and family that will be able to come to the show, um, and to be telling such an important story. Um, uh, this cast is incredible, um, and uh, it's a show that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, a lot of uh, Timothy Laughlin, um, the character that I'm playing, uh, is actually some of my own personal story. Um, and uh, just generally, really quick um, on the show, uh, it is uh, it is set in the McCarthy era, and it is about um, a love story that happens to be between uh, two men um, that work uh, for the government. I'm playing one of them. Uh, Hadley Adams, my castmate, uh, is playing um, my my counter love part. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's this love story that's set during the Lavender Scare, uh, which is an actual, real um, part of our history um, here. Um, uh, it's set in D.C. Uh, it's just a part of our history that hasn't really been told much. Um, and we're really excited to be able to tell that story. Hmm. Uh, Adelaide, tell us uh, about yourself a little bit. Hi, um, I'm hello. Adelaide Bodecker. Welcome. Uh, hello, um, I'm from Sarasota, Florida, so I'm another Floridian, but not from Miami. I'm not that cool. Um, but this is my first time singing with Florida Grand, and I'm stoked about it. And I play Mary Johnson in Fellow Travelers, and I um, I work for um, Hadley's character, Hawkins Fuller, but I'm also one of his best friends and I become one of Timothy's best friends. Um, the three of us are pals and um, I, I don't know, guys, would you have insight? I, I, um, I don't know. I'm instrumental in some, I don't want to ruin what happens in the show. So I don't want to say what happens, but I'm there for some of key points, but um, I'm, I am witnessing their love and I support them. And um, actually it's, um, a really special part to play because I don't know in that era, I don't think that would have been a normal thing to find. Um, and I don't know. I love being able to play this character and be an ally on stage. Um, so yeah, I don't know. There we go. It sounds like fun. Emily, yeah. uh, Emily tell us about yourself. <clears throat> uh, hi everyone. I'm Emily Centuria. I am the conductor uh, for fellow travelers at okay. NGO. I'm from San Francisco. Um, this is my first time. This is my first time in Miami, uh, and my, my debut at FGO. Uh, I've conducted this piece before once uh, at Boston Barrett Opera. It is one of my favorite pieces to conduct. It is just gorgeous and the most fun. And this cast has been amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is uh, scored for a uh, uh, chamber orchestra. It is scored for chamber orchestra. It's kind of an unusual uh, collection of instruments. Um, in addition to strings, there's flute, oboe, clarinet, piano, and two trombones. Um, mm. So it's it's a very uh, unusual uh, collection of instruments, but it creates a really particular individual sound, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of special f for this piece. Uh, mm. Mm. Uh, Hadley, tell us uh, you're a little bit about yourself and your role in Fellow Travelers. Certainly. Uh, g'day. My name is Hadley. I'm from uh, New Zealand originally, but home is now California. Uh, this is my second time in this part of the world. I was here in January with Florida Grand Opera for Streetcar Named Desire. Um, so very happy to be back. And Fort Lauderdale is maybe my favorite part of all of Florida. Um, we left Miami yesterday and I love Miami, but like, I really love Fort Lauderdale. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> uh, 
my character Hawkins Fuller is a um, he is a man who works for the State Department. He's got a very successful career. He knows himself. He's straight passing. And the way he sees the world is that he can have sex with men, um, but you don't get to have a relationship. You're not one of those um, kinds of men who do that. Um, and that's what makes him okay with his life and with his choices that he makes. And that what matters to him is having an hour with a man. And that's all it is. Uh, because why wouldn't you want a family and have a wife and kids and be normal? Uh, and then he meets Timothy Laughlin, who's uh, about, let's say about 10 years younger and has these ideals that the world can be more than that. We don't have to have this kind of heteronormative uh, structure, which, you know, in the 50s is wildly revolutionary. And for Hawkins, who thinks he's got it all figured out, he's like, oh, no, you're so young. You don't understand. We don't get that. And it's these two people who like care about each other so much in such honest ways who keep kind of slightly missing each other in the way they communicate because the language isn't there yet. The, the history isn't there. The, the lifestyle isn't there. Um, and it's this beautiful story in the backdrop uh, of McCarthyism, the Lavender Scare, where I was of 5,000 LGBT people lost their jobs, many commit suicide after being um, denounced as communists and, and threats to the US state. Um, it's an amazing piece and I'm, I've spoken for too long already, but one thing I will say, modern opera, people often have this conception that it's very dun, 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 And it's so far from that. It is like the most lyrical music theater-ish the composer hates when I use that term, but I mean it in the most beautiful way opera that there is it's so tonal and beautiful and beyond heartbreaking and the only opera i've ever seen that i cry in every time i see it mm. um yeah mm. i i do want to hear more about that cindy tell us about your role as leadership there at the opera but i do want to wrap up wrap around back to the love story that is so unique in this opera cindy tell us about your role but we're going to get back to that absolutely uh you're on mute There we go. Sorry, we go. that has to happen at least one time in every video call. That's um, okay. Thank you, Stephen. Um, my name is Cindy Sadler. I wouldn't say I'm in leadership here, but I am the marketing and communications manager. Just moved here in October to take this role. My previous role with the uh, Florida Grand Opera was as a singer back in 2012. Um, so I am here working on publicizing this fantastic show and these wonderful artists and um, it's, it's very exciting for me to be here during Florida Grand Opera's 80th anniversary season. 80 years for an opera company is, is a good long run. And I'm very excited about us presenting shows like Fellow Travelers, um, our next upcoming show, Agrippina. Um, Florida Grand is known for adventurous programming. And, um, and I just invite everyone to visit our website, www.fgo.org, and check out all we have to offer, concerts as well as these shows and conversations and um, all kinds of interesting things. And I will say one thing about um, coming to an opera like this. If you haven't been to an opera before, this is a really good one to start with. It's in English. It is an intimate setting. It is contemporary in a time that you're going to have some kind of familiarity with. So you will know the body language, the costumes, the, the set will make sense. And it is a very beautiful love story and it's a historical moment. So I do invite you to please come and see this opera. And we have some great promos too. So check it out on the website. Um, I want to hear a little more about the era that it's set in because uh, I talked to the younger generation now who I mentioned Will and Grace, who didn't see Will and Grace in broadcast and they didn't see the flip of culture that that particular show brought. This is way before Will and Grace, way before that, way before the internet and cell phones and our minds don't understand what the culture was like in the 50s. And I lived through Will and Grace, what it was like for two men to meet and to be in a relationship then to go through that and the hiding. And on top of that, to fear maybe to being fired and all of that was going on. If you could speak to that, the parallel of um, antagonistic society with the love story that's going on, is that kind of uh, what is what the story is about? 
Uh, yeah, I can I can speak uh, a little on that. Um, so uh, you know, you if if you can put yourself in the mindset of a world that uh, there is no social media, there is no uh, there is no phone. Actually, my my character Timothy Laughlin doesn't even have a, a house phone. Um, so uh, you know, it was a lot of uh, well, that plus you know the the, the pressure of being gay, being not only uh, religiously, you know, uh, detrimental and detrimental to your, your livelihood. Um, it was also that very immediately, um, in your place of work, uh, and, uh, you know, your financial income. Um, so, uh, it was very risky to do anything that, um, even alluded to you being gay. Um, and, uh, very specifically, um, uh, this opera, you, you, there's a scene, an interrogation scene where, where you see the process of um, this sort of a witch hunt uh, that went on um, uh, within this specific unit um, in the government. And um, I mean, it, it was traumatizing, let alone uh, uh, something that uh, created sort of a vocabulary for um, the future generation um, that said, hey, you cannot do these things. You cannot speak with a lisp. You cannot walk with a sway in your head. You cannot do, you cannot dress, uh, you, you cannot wear pants if you're a woman. You cannot, um, you know, you have to wear heels. Um, and this vocabulary uh, really sort of painted a picture of what was masculine and feminine uh, and what was acceptable and not. Um, and we really see the danger um, in the way that we wrote history with our homophobia um in this piece uh and it, it, it's very powerful because it is all factual <laughs> um and i i say that with a laugh because uh, um uh it, it is uh it, it's very serious um uh so yeah i mean uh, uh, specifically to find other people um uh in this scene uh, we see some or in this opera we see in the first scene um some of i guess what we would consider cruising in the uh, gay community uh, that went on and uh, these sort of known spots um, uh, within the gay community, uh, specifically in Washington, D.C. Historically, um, DuPont Circle uh, was one of those spots. Um, and uh, that's where Hawk and Tim first meet mm -hmm. in the show. Tell us our, what you're allowed to give away. Tell us a little bit about the love story. Because that's where I heard the passion. Tell us about the love story. Or either of you. Or Hadley yeah. or Andy, either one. I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Um, yeah, so <laughs> there is two uh, really quite very interesting characters. Um, one, as I said before, thinks he kind of understands the world and he's figured it out the way that I guess uh, men and generation above him helped him figure it out. You know, I mean, change comes generationally often, um, if not for, you know, um, awful occurrences in history. Um, and, uh, and Tim's that next generation. So he's already seeing what people have at this point and is striving for the next part. Um, and that's, I think the beautiful thing in their relationship, they see each other very much for who they are, but I think they both feel that each other has kind of a flaw that is quite easily solvable in the other's mind. Um, uh, but I mean, we become entrenched in our beliefs. Uh, and I think as we get older, it's easy to become, this is how things are, um, because it keeps you feeling safe. And when you're still very young, you have the possibility of whatever future you want, because you're still writing the history of your generation. Um, and again, it's hard to, you don't want to, there's not a lot of, usually in Opry, like what happens if it's called Tosca, she dies. If it's called Traviata, she's going to die. Um, this isn't like that. <laughs> There is like a lot that you you wouldn't guess is going to happen, okay. uh, and so it's nice to go into an opera and know I have no idea what's going on or what's going to happen, but it's going to be very easy to find out. Also, this is one of the only operas I think that people watching it, you really forget you're watching an opera. Like Addie saw the first uh, production of this, her um, husband was in it, um, and uh, which Andy and I were in, and. Um, she, I remember when we first started working on this, she said, you know, it's funny, I watched that so many times and you forget you're watching an opera because the music is very, uh, it's not very elongated and long. It's very direct. It's very, 
And it's, that's how I say it. it's kind of like a musical in a way where the immediacy of the words hit clearly and very efficiently and beautifully. Mm. And it's very easy to, I think for all of us to think we've both been a Tim or Hawkins in a relationship. We've both wanted more. We've both tried to push them in a way because we couldn't give more in ways that weren't fair or, or caring in the right way. Um, there's a lot of each of us in these characters. Mm. I can't wait to see it myself. Um, Emily, I'm curious, because this is a newer opera in English, tell us a little bit about the style uh, of music. Is it what uh, I think of as traditional opera music? Or uh, give us some insight into the style of music, if you don't mind. Well, I, I'm afraid to say what I want to say about it now that I know that uh, Greg Spears doesn't like it being described as musical <laughs> theater. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it, it is entirely unlike it anything else that people are writing today. Um, it's it's a kind of musical theater meets uh, American minimalism uh, meets Baroque um, aesthetic. He, he writes with these uh, amazing sort of sustained harmonies um, that, that remind me of minimalism. There's, there's a lot of repetition. Um, there's also a, a great rhythmic engine, um, which I think com comes from a, a Baroque influence. Um, but there's also just really tuneful, gorgeous lyrical melodies. Um, it's it's the most amazing combination uh, of things, um, and <laughs> yeah. So I, I would definitely say musical theater. Sorry, Greg. <laughs> and I've always wanted to ask this question of people who sing opera: How can you sing that long with pieces that uh, vibrant and still have a voice at the end of the night? <laughs> Because that is a lot uh, on your voice. How do you do that and still and then come on again and sing all of that again? What what is the secret to that much vocalization? Because I had a lot years of years and years of training. I had a friends who were a lot of voice majors in college. Yeah, yeah, lots of training. I mean, I don't know, Hadley, Andy, and when you say so, I mean, we've all I think worked for a long time um, working on that specific thing, and so you get used to it, and it's you you do it day in and day out, and this this piece specifically, I know Hadley already said it. I know Andy also has the same thing happen. I do as well. I think all three of us break down in tears in the show, um, which like actually Paul, one of our pianists, and he plays piano in the pit on this. He's like, how are you like, doing that? He asked me about it like uh, three nights ago. And I was like, we just like lean into it and we do it. So like, it's a little bit different than, um, you know, singing Tosca or Traviata, which I would not sing either of those, but maybe in my wildest dreams, if I was singing that, it would probably be a little bit different, but I don't know. We, we've worked at it for so long. I don't know. Do you guys have any thing to say about it's that kind of stuff? Of who you are. Yeah. Um, I have to say, uh, I, this is like the longest tenor role I think like in any modern piece um I'm learning one of the longest tenor roles in the classic repertoire right now which is the merino and um I feel like in a lot of ways this is more challenging um because of the like the range in this um and I have to say that like dr both dramatically and vocally uh both Greg's wrote this um, in a way that is extremely exposed. Um, and um, he, they did that on purpose, <laughs> clearly. And uh, you get to see us at like, see all of us on stage and hear all of us uh, in this piece. Um, and I, I think it, it naturally like introduces a level of vulnerability that is unlike any other opera because it's, uh, it is so, it's just so visceral um, because you, it, that's the only way you can do this piece, I think. Um, and I think that's why it works really, really well. Very good. Well, I'm going to pop quiz. So I'm going to each ask each of you the same question in one sentence. What would you like the audience to leave with if they could only leave with one thing after seeing the show in one sentence? I'm going to put you on the spot. If they can only leave with one thing they remember from seeing the show. You've got, you've got to, you're, okay, we're singers. You've got to point to someone and say, Hadley. 
Headley, just, Headley, you're first. We've been taught through years not to sing <laughs> until someone points Head, at you. Headley, you're first. Okay, but if Emily had gone, Headley, I would have. <laughs> yeah. um, Headley, you're first. Uh, okay, okay. Um, so, question once more was what I want uh, someone to leave. Yes, if they, if your audience only leaves with one memory, uh, what would you want them to leave with after actually, the show? Actually, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question by not answering it. I'm okay. going to say what I would love um, okay. a version of that is for them to come in to the space wanting to feel, mm. like not not coming in like no no no, but like be open to the world and to these characters and just have those moments where you think. Where, where am I in that? When have I been in that situation? Because that's, I think, the best way I would like them to experience the piece. Because by being that open to the piece and to the story, that's how you leave uh, somewhat changed, I think. Hmm. Changed. That's one thing about music is that you should never leave unchanged when you leave the orchestra or the symphony or the opera. Uh, Adelaide, I'll put you on the spot next. What's one thing you'd like for the audience to leave with? I would love for the audience to leave knowing that it is okay and that we all should love on one another. Even if you have a completely different background, a completely different life experience to lead with love. I know that's longer than a sentence, but okay. that's what I want people to bring from this because at the heart of it, it's loving on other people. I don't know. Yeah. That's very good. Emily? For me, I hope that what an audience member might get out of seeing this piece is that something that happens on stage resonates with maybe something they haven't told anyone about, maybe something they, they haven't articulated in their own life, but that they need to feel understood about and that they feel understood having seen the piece. Hmm. Hmm. Andy? Sorry, that is beautiful, Emily. That is so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And it's, it's uh, I'm sort of uh, in that same vein. I want people to uh, leave the theater feeling seen um, in whatever way they, they need to um, and whatever their opinion is or isn't um, about this piece. Um, I want them to be able to uh, have peace with who they are. Okay. Cindy? Um, wow, following up all those wonderful and beautiful thoughts, um, my hope would be that people would leave having had an amazing and meaningful experience um, and that they would leave with the realization that whatever they think opera is um, or whatever they thought opera was when they walked into the theater, that it is that, but it's a lot of other things too. And it's never the same thing every time, each time you walk in. It's a completely different experience. Sometimes even, even if you came back to see the same show, it might be a different experience. So I hope that people will be open not only to the, the message of this opera, but just the message of opera and great art in general. Well, this is truly a unique experience. I hope everyone comes out to see this. Uh, I want to give the dates one last time, and that's going to be April 23rd through the 28th, 2022 at Lauder Hill Performing Arts. It is uh, a quick eight, 10 minute drive here from Wilton Manors, Fort Lauderdale. Parking is easy and cheap. It's easy to get in and out of the building. So it's super, super easy to get to. It is a beautiful venue. We want to thank Florida Grand Opera and all of their uh, talent and performance and leadership for putting this on channel. If you can put up the website one last time, we can show people uh, fgo.org. We're gonna put up the website. Uh, oops, we both clicked at the same time. Uh, you've got some other uh, shows going on. So please go. Uh, you're probably gonna have subscriptions coming up for the upcoming season. I have been personally, these are one of my, as an organist and pianist, I love going to the opera and appreciate the music, the sets and everything are just, it's a truly um, amazing experience to go. And I personally recommend it. I love hearing them sing. And again, how they can sing for that long. I appreciate what it takes to get up there and, and do that and how much talent it takes to do that. And we appreciate you being part of us. So we're going to put up your social media as well. Chandler has that. Uh, you've got it pretty easy. Uh, Facebook.com slash Florida Grand Opera. 
uh, your Twitter and your other pages. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. We can't wait to see this. And thank you for putting this on and being bold and taking a step for uh, this unique opera. We are outclick.com, O-U-T-C-L-I-Q-U-E.com. Uh, everyone, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you at Florida Grand Opera, fellow travelers. Thank you so much. See y'all. Thank you.